All right, well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, today. We just pray that you will bless our time and bless our study and uh, just bless all of those uh, among our family and friends who are having a difficult time right now and just bring about healing and deliverance. We give you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I know Thanksgiving just got over, but I wanted to, uh, we're kind of in between sections of the study, and so I wanted to take a few uh, a few weeks to look at some Christmas prophecies. So let me, uh, <coughs> excuse me, let me define a little bit of terminology, and we're probably going to look at about one prophecy and then its fulfillment per night and have plenty of time to discuss it. So, uh, yeah. When I say Christmas prophecies, and I've actually never heard anybody use this particular phrase besides myself, but I, I mean, it's obviously putting together two things. But we talk a lot about prophecies of Jesus, prophecies of the coming of Christ, and sometimes we call those Christological prophecies. Um, those don't all have to do with his birth. They have to do with a lot of different aspects of who Jesus is and was. But um, next couple of weeks, I'm just going to hone in on a few Christmas prophecies that deal specifically with the birth of Christ and tie into what we call the birth narratives. Now, if you don't know that term, birth narratives, it's just a way of describing in Matthew and Luke, both Matthew and Luke have a, a section where it talks about the birth of Jesus. It talks about the circumstances surrounding his birth, you know, the angelic announcements and all of this stuff. And there's a few uh, Christmas prophecies that I call that because they tie directly into the fulfillment of the birth narratives. So the first one we are going to talk about, and it seems like an odd place, but... This is not the first prophecy about Jesus in the Bible, but I think in a sense, it's the first Christmas prophecy. So it's the one I'm going to begin with. And it is actually, let's see here, in the book of Numbers. We don't usually think of Numbers as having a lot of prophecies about Christ, but the first uh, Christmas prophecy is in Numbers. And in Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 24 and uh, verses 15 to 19. But before I get into that, and it's why we need a, a little bit of time, I want to put the prophecy in its context a little bit. So it actually comes in uh, the context of one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Now, if you get to know me and you hear me talking about the Bible, a lot of times I'll be like, oh, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and sooner or later they add up into the hundreds. So I guess I, I do like the Bible, although I've never liked it on Facebook. I remember when, my first, when I first got on Facebook, I saw, oh, so-and-so likes the Bible, and I didn't understand liking it, and I was like, oh, what does that mean? Anyway, but putting that, putting that aside for a moment... So the book of Numbers, Numbers 22 to 24, these, these three chapters, they tell the story of a figure by the name of Balaam. Perhaps that is uh, familiar to you. You might want to go to Numbers, you can start it with Numbers 22 in your Bible. And uh, if you want to go to Numbers 22, we're going to talk a little bit about this figure Balaam, and I just want to, I, I'm not going to read through all these chapters, there's way too much, but I am going to kind of walk you through the story and what happened, culminating in this, uh, in this prophecy about something to do with Christmas. All right, so, uh, this is during the time when Israel is doing their wanderings in the wilderness, and uh, be before they enter into the promised land. And they're going through a territory that is near a nation called Moab. M-O-A-B. You may have heard of that. And I'm not talking about Moab, Utah, which is uh, a place here in the United States. Moab was a country uh, near Israel. And when the Israelites were near Moab, the king of Moab, and his name was Balak. It's almost exactly like Balaam, but with a K. Balak. He didn't like the Israelites being so close to his territory. 
They were very numerous. There were a lot of them, and he'd heard about the plagues in Egypt, and he was afraid of what Israel might do to his nation. And so he wanted to kind of have a preemptive strike. You guys probably know what a preemptive strike is. But he didn't want to like go attack them with military force because they had more people than he did. So what he wanted to do, and this is like in the, con in a, in the context of uh, this ancient world here, he knew of this prophet who lived, I guess, in his nation, and the prophet's name was Balaam. Now, Balaam is a really interesting figure in the Bible because he seems to be a prophet of the one true God. He seems to actually be able to prophesy real prophecies, but he's not an Israelite. He seems to be a Moabite, and let's just say his character leaves a lot to, leaves a lot to be desired, and yet I guess he has made some real prophecies and does somehow have a connection to uh, the true God. And so what Balak, the king of Moab, wants to do is he wants to get this prophet to... Uh, put a curse on the people of Israel. He wants him to, to pronounce a curse, thinking that if Balaam will pronounce a prophetic curse, then the God who he represents will honor that curse, if it will, and curse these people. So Balaam, or Balak, he really wants to kind of get a supernatural edge on Israel. He wants to make sure that they're not going to prosper or something. So, he sends some messengers to Balaam, and they basically offer him a bunch of money to curse the people of Israel. Now, Balaam's initial response is, I can't, do, I can't say anything but what the Lord tells me to say. Balaam consults with the Lord, and the Lord tells him at first not to go. Don't do it. But... Balaam is really insistent that he wants to go with them, and the Lord says, okay, if they come get you and ask you to come with them in the morning, then go with them. So Balaam, he wants to go so bad, he's hoping that somehow he's going to get some money out of this. He's, a, he's kind of a, a money-minded guy, and so in the morning he goes and he like tells them, hey, let's go. Instead of waiting to hear if they come to him, he goes to them he says, let's go, and it says that he saddled his donkey, and that's an important point in this whole story. So we got Balaam, he's riding his donkey, he's going to see the king of Moab, who's going to try to get him to curse the people of Israel. But remember, he didn't follow God's rules, he didn't do it the way God wanted him to do it, and because of this, God, God gives him an encounter on the way, he stops and gives him this encounter. And this is actually kind of one of my uh, favorite parts here, because what we get is we get this uh, talking animal in this story. Well, the animal only speaks one time, but it's a really interesting little story. So uh, let me just read a little bit here. This is in Numbers 22, and let me find out exactly what I want. Okay, so Numbers 22 and beginning in verse 21, it says, Balaam got up in the morning saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, that's the donkey who saw that, she turned off the road into the field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. He's not being very nice. This is some animal cruelty here. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. So Balaam is getting mad at this donkey, and he is again carrying out this animal cruelty. And it says in 28, Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. This is funny. I don't know if any of you guys have ever gotten mad at your car. 
But sometimes when my car breaks down, I almost want to start beating on it, right? And I feel like if I started yelling at the car, like, what's wrong with you? If it answered back, I would probably get in an argument before I noticed what's going on. The car's talking to me, you know? This is kind of what's going on here. He doesn't even notice that the donkey's talking because he's so mad. He, like, enters into it. Um, let's see. Balaam answered to the donkey, you've made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? Donkey's asking a rhetorical question. No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. One of the things I, I love about that is all it says is that the Lord opened the donkey's mouth. It says the Lord, like, allowed the donkey to, to speak. One of my Hebrew professors uh, made the observation that once the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, the donkey had things to say. And I, always get a, I always get a kick out of that. You know, you wonder sometimes when we've probably all seen, you know, people being unreasonable with their animals. And, then, you know, you kind of wonder... What would that animal say if they could talk? It's really, uh, we got that one, uh, that one example of it. Okay, just wanted to camp out there for a while because I think that's a lot of fun. But so here's what happens. Balaam actually ends up making four different prophecies. And the reason for this is because here's what Balak, the king of Moab, says to him. And I'm, again, I'm summarizing a lot of the information we get. But he says to him, um... You know, prophesy against the people. So they go up on a, on a hill, and they look down over the people that are scattered over this valley, and they build an altar, they give a sacrifice, and Balaam prophesies what the Lord tells him. What the Lord tells him is not a curse on the people, it's a blessing. And um, Balak is like, what's going on here? You were supposed to curse them. And Balaam's like, well, maybe if we go to a different spot. And so this, they go through this four different times where they're like, well, if we go to... Where Balaam's like, well, if we go to a different spot, maybe the Lord will let me curse them from there. But every time the Lord gives Balaam a blessing rather than a curse. And he had told the king of Moab, well, I can only say what the Lord says. But this is interesting because Balaam, he seems to have had this kind of like almost channel with the Lord. And yet he seems to really want the reward money that's going to be offered by the king if he curses. And so what does he do? The fourth time, he tries to curse. He decides, I'm not going to say what the Lord told me. I'm just going to say a curse because I want the money. What the Lord does in that case is the Lord kind of uh, overpowers Balaam and forces him to give another blessing. So even when Balaam tries to curse the people of Israel, the Lord won't let him do that. And in that blessing, this, this brings us to where we're at in Numbers 24. That's when Balaam gives this final blessing. And I'm just going to read you part of it, and then we'll talk about what, uh, what is going on here. So, Numbers 22, beginning in verse 15, it says, He took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open." The oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the uh, Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall arise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed, Seir, his enemies shall be dispossessed, Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of the cities. All right, so let me put this in context. One of the things that keeps happening is that when God pronounces blessing on Israel, he also pronounces curses on their enemies. Edom and Moab are surrounding nations that, that um, at different times and for different reasons are enemies of Israel. But in doing this, he begins by giving this prophecy that is a prophecy about the coming of Jesus. It says, I see him, but not now. That's talking about seeing in a vision the Messiah who's going to come, but it's not time for that yet. He says, um, again, I behold him, but not near. And the point is that prophetically, in this prophecy, in this vision, Balaam can see the Messiah, but... 
it's not time yet, and it's not even close. It's going to be quite a while before Jesus comes. That's what it means when it says he is not near. But it says a star shall come out of Jacob. And Jacob here, you guys probably realize this, but Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, Abraham's grandson. And he was kind of the main founder of the nation Israel because Jacob's name was actually changed to Israel. But sometimes in the Bible, it refers to him as Jacob, and sometimes it refers to him as Israel. And so sometimes when it's talking about the nation of Israel, it will call it Israel. Other times it will call it Jacob. So I say that because when it says uh, it will come out of Jacob, it means it will come out of Israel. Hmm. Note that word star, because here we have a star associated with the coming of the Messiah. And I think you guys can probably uh, begin to see where this is going. Then it goes on to say a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And throughout, throughout history, kings... The scepter was usually something that was held by a king, a symbol of royal authority. So this is a prophecy about a coming king who will ultimately be victorious over, um, over Israel's enemies. All right, so the reason we're focusing on this has to do with the, the fact that this is a king prophecy about the Messiah who is coming. But it's going to be a while now. And it actually talks about a star arising out of Israel. Now, that could mean a couple of things in context. It could mean that the Messiah himself is being personified or viewed as a star, like we, you know, like we do today, you know, a rising star. Or it could be that there's some, uh, there's some sort of a star that will be associated with the Messiah's coming. Or it could be, it could have a kind of a double meaning where, where we have a, a two, a dual meaning, like I said, a double meaning where, where the Messiah is the star that will rise, but there will be a star that actually signals his coming, which is probably what is going on here. Okay, keep your finger in numbers and go in your Bibles from there to Luke chapter 2. To see how this flushes out. It's, it's December. It's close enough to Christmas for us to start reading these Christmas narratives. Not that you have to wait till Christmas time to read these, you know, these Christmas stories. They're good any time of year. But Luke chapter 2 gives us the, uh, the story of the Magi, also known as the Wise Men. And I'm going to work through some of this and pay attention to a little bit of uh, a little bit of key language I'm not going to go into all the details there's a lot of details I'm actually Luke chapter 2 I'm actually going to preach a sermon on before too long so we'll uh, we'll give a little we'll talk more about Caesar Augustus and stuff like that later but uh, in the days of Caesar Augustus or in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world what I want. I said Luke. Well, I am going to preach about Luke chapter 2, but what I actually want is Matthew. I even have Luke in my notes, and I blame you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Matthew, Luke. Matthew 2, Luke 2. You know how it is. Now let's make sure I even have the chapter right. I do. Okay, good. Luke, not Matthew. I was going to say, I see for Augustus. I think we're in the wrong spot. We will talk, right, thank you. We will talk about Caesar Augustus soon enough on a, on a Sunday morning. He was actually a fairly important fellow, but, okay. Uh, Luke 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and said, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, just before we go on, notice two things are mentioned there that were mentioned in the Numbers prophecy. We have the star, and we have the king. They use the word scepter in Numbers, but scepter, obviously, I might even, uh, I may as well, even, you know, put this here so we see that scepter is king. 
16. Once we realize that the scepter that arises out of Jacob is descriptive of the king of Israel. It's a, we call this a circumlocution. And a circumlocution is where one word is used in place of another. So sometimes the king himself is described by the symbol of his authority, the scepter. The scepter is pointing us to the one who has the right to rule. And so the wise men, when they, uh, when they bring this up, notice that they say, we have seen his star. I don't know about you, but I don't, you know, I don't know anybody on earth today who you could say owns a star. Some people have stars named after them, but you know, nobody really owns a star, but they say we have seen his star. And what they're talking about probably is the prophecy in Numbers about the star that will arise out of Jacob, which means out of Israel, and uh, signal the coming of this king. And for one reason or another, and we can speculate, and we will here, but uh, for one reason or another, these magi, these wise men, were looking for a sign of this Israelite king. Um, I want to say a little bit about the star before I go on. <laughs> if you use that, uh, that classic scholarly tool known as Google, and you Google Bethlehem star, you're going to find all kinds of really interesting information about things relating to uh, cosmology, what was going on in the heavens in and around the time of Jesus and stuff like that. And I think that's all very valuable. It's really interesting to see, uh, you know, some things God has, has done or written in the stars. However, I want to make an observation. I think that the star, the Bethlehem star, I don't think it was actually a ball of gas burning billions of miles away, the way you and I think of a star. Now you're thinking, well, the Bible says it was a star, but you have to understand that the description, this wasn't intended to be a scientific description. They didn't, the average person wouldn't have known scientifically what a star was. To them, what it was was a speck of light that you could see in the sky, right? And so they probably, any speck of white light you could see in the, lot, in the sky, they would probably have described as a star. The reason I mention this is because what the Bethlehem star does Balls of gas burning billions of miles away, they don't do that. What I mean is the star moved in a way that they could follow it on donkeys for several hundred miles. Now, let me just observe that if you're going to try to find a star that's going to move in such a way in the heavens that you can follow it, you're probably not going to find that. Stars don't really do that. Not, not, not th those kinds of stars, you know, the actual cosmological stars. It says that the star actually rested above the manger where Jesus lay when, you get to, when we get to that point. I'll read that in a minute. But so, again, stars don't do that. Stars are so high, if I were to look, if I were to go out in our parking lot and the lights went out, because we can't see anything with these lights, and I were to look right above me, and if I saw a star that looked like it was directly above me, that would, I, I, I could go five miles away down to Santee, maybe to Holly's house. So a star that looked like it was directly above me from the church, it, if I went to Holly's house, it would still look like it was directly above me. You follow what I'm saying? I wouldn't be able to see that movement. And that's like, what, maybe five miles, I want to say, give or take. And Bethlehem was about five miles, give or take, from, from Jerusalem. It is, actually. It still is. It's still there. Uh, five to seven miles. Go ahead, Holly. I just have a question about the star. So, are they like clouds? Like, you know how when you read names, it's like there's a cloud and then there's a cloud and then there's a cloud. And then there's a cloud and then there's a cloud. It's like, well, that's, I'm curious about the star. All right. I'm, I'm going to acknowledge first and foremost that I am not an expert in cosmology, but I can answer the question to some degree. The question was, you know, about stars. Do they, do they look like they're moving like clouds? Stars do move but not, the, not in the way clouds do. Depending on its height, you could, you could almost follow a cloud from one city to another. Stars have a movement. In fact, you know, sailors, before, before modern technology and you know, radio equipment and stuff, sailors, the way they figured out where they were going in their ships was they would use the stars to guide them. So you can do a lot of things with the stars uh, for traveling vast distances. 
And stars, star, the, the, the stars, because stars have a regular pattern of movement. They have an orbit. And so they move around the same way. You, you could say very literally, what goes around comes around. That's why Halley's Comet shows up every however many decades, right? And so what goes, so, so um, that does happen and you can use the star, stars to guide you. But what they don't do is they don't lead you from one city to another town five miles away. They don't work like that. They're too far away. The distance is too great for you to follow a star in the heavens in that way. And so, and, what, and another thing they don't do is they don't shine direct on one pinpoint location in, is there any color you say? Um, I think so. I mean, I think if you were to, man, if, if, you, if you were to see some of these Hubble Space Telescope things, there's a the mighty pretty stuff. But what I'm getting at is I think there's, I think what they saw was a real shining orb that looked to their eyes like a star. But I think what it was was something more like some kind of visible manifestation of God's glory to signal the Messiah. To them, it looked like a star. We have similar things to that in the Bible, like even in the wilderness with Israel. During the day, they would follow a pillar of cloud, whereas at night, they would follow a pillar of fire. Sometimes God gives these visible manifestations of himself to give somebody, people something to follow. And that, I, so I think there's something supernatural going on. I don't think we want to get carried away with the alignment of the heavenly luminaries. I just don't think it quite, I don't think that quite fits the story. Let me, let me keep reading and starting in verse 3. When King Herod saw this, he was disturbed... And all Jerusalem with him, and called together the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, and asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a shepherd who will be the shepherd of your people Israel. Now that's another messianic prophecy. We'll just put that up here. That was a... Uh, Micah 5.2, and everybody knew that was a prophecy of the Messiah. And so that told them that he would be born in, in Bethlehem. So Herod is kind of um, gathering information, and the teachers in Israel have that one right. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out the exact time the star had appeared. There you go. There's another thing. The star appears and disappears, depending on what's going on. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find them, report it to me so that I too may come and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them. Notice that they can see this thing move. It moves ahead of them until it stops. It moves so it can lead them, and it stops. And it's just, again, luminaries billions of miles away in the heaven just don't work like that. So that's why I think, again, it was a miraculous manifestation of God's God's glory here. Okay. It moved ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And that's what I'm talking about. If the star is that far away and it's, you know, you're not going to like feel like it's right above any one pinpoint place. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed and coming to the house, they saw the child and mother his mother Mary, they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. All right, and then God warns them in a dream not to talk to Herod, and there's a, there's a lot of other events there. So, um, you know, this is a well-known story, but the main, the main point we're making is the star, which I think was a supernatural manifestation of God's glory that actually visibly appeared and actually led them is a star that was signaled in or uh, prophesied in Numbers 24. And these guys were savvy enough in their Old Testament. Interesting question I'll come to in a minute because somehow these guys were savvy enough in their Old Testament that they could recognize this thing when it, was looked, when it, when it appeared to them. My suspicion is that from where they were, which was probably in the general area of Babylon, they could probably see it probably appeared to their eyes as though it was rising out of Israel. And uh, that gave them something, you know, something to follow. So they probably saw something very visible here and probably 
associated it right away with numbers, and we're like, we got to go see this Israelite king. We got the star rising out of Israel. We got the king coming. All right, I need to erase a little bit of this because when you see star, I mean the court record is this. In verse two, we saw his star. His star. I mean, it's very sad that he goes down the star and on our walk to Jerusalem, Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think Hollywood's going to give him one, but <laughs> that's a point. Jesus had a. His star that they saw, but uh, yeah, I don't know. All those other guys got one, right? He said everybody name him, but they. Claude was just observing the irony, you know. He <laughs> no, he had his own star here, but no star on the on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. All right. Well, uh, one of the things I, I don't know if I've ever shared with you guys, and I don't like to brag, but you know, in addition to being a pastor, I'm also a kind of an expert map maker. So I'm going to draw you guys one of my expert maps here because it's going to fit into a, it's going to fit into the story. Okay, that's a joke if you didn't understand. It's one of my jokes I use in my college classes right before I draw some version of what I'm about to draw for you. We're going to call this the Mediterranean coast. This is the Mediterranean Sea over here. All right, we have Israel right here, and then over here to the east, we have the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, call it Tigris, and they call that Euphrates, and down here we have, a, I think I've got this right, I better if I'm an expert, right? Babylon. Okay, this is entirely to scale. I'm just kidding. All right. So, uh, if you know your Old Testament, you know that there was a time when Babylon was at the height of its power, and they traveled to Israel, Judah, southern Israel, and they conquered it, and they carried the people away into Babylon. What I want to, uh, what I want to, another thing I want to do. This is the middle of the desert, all right? This is like the the dry land, this is the wilderness, this is the hot, hot desert. But in here, I'm going to put one of these little directional things. So you can see we got north, we got south, we got west, and we have east. Now, which, where does it say the Magi came from? Which direction? The east. And on a map such as this one, if you were to go... From, if you were to draw a line from Israel to Babylon, from, from Jerusalem or, or Bethlehem to Babylon, it's not precisely east, but it's almost it's almost a straight line east from Bethlehem to, to, to uh, Babylon, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, give or take a, a, a hundred miles or something here. It's almost a straight line. My suspicion is that these Magi, or these wise men, came from Babylon. If you read the book of Daniel, we talked about the book of Daniel not all that long ago in Angelology. Great book. If you read it, one of the things you'll find out is that the main character, Daniel, he was made head because of the prophecies, the dreams he interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He was made head, he was made head of the king's Magi. In the Old Testament, it says that in, in the old King James, that is, it said the king is wise man. This is the same word that is describing the Magi who came to see Jesus. My suspicion was that when Daniel was the head of the Magi in Babylon, he probably would have schooled them, taught them about the God of Israel and the Old Testament scriptures. And so probably it's the legacy of the prophet Daniel that these guys were interested in this Jewish Messiah and were, you know, studying and knew the signs to, to work with. One of the things we know about Magi in the ancient world, you probably, you may have put this together that, that the word, we actually get the word magic from Magi. That's, that's from the same root. It doesn't mean they were magicians exactly. But it does. Uh, they were. They were. 
kind of the intellectual elite of their society. They were the smart guys. They were the, they were the equivalent of, of, of our, you know, PhDs and stuff today, and they knew their stuff. They were highly educated and highly intelligent, and probably because of the prophecies of Daniel, that was why they wanted to travel to Israel when they saw Somehow, I don't know exactly how it would have appeared to them, we, we can use our imagination, but somehow they saw some sort of luminary, some sort of light probably rising out of this general area, and they were like, okay, that is the symbol of the Israelite, or for the Israelite king, because uh, this was pretty well known. This, is, this would have been pretty well known if they were studying the Old Testament scriptures, this prophecy in Numbers. So... Question. Go ahead, Holly. Okay, about the book of Judges. Did anyone know about what was going on with the Jews? Mm. Oh, in our study of the Gospel of Mark, it just reminds me of this. We're always talking about these ironies, right? These grand ironies going on. One of the ironies is that you have these, forgive the word, foreigners, these non Israelites who are the ones who are aware of what's going on. Some people in Israel knew Holy, but for the most part, people had missed this. God had uh, God had revealed it to, to Gentiles, but, well, it seems, it just doesn't seem like, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem like the, the Israelites were uh, savvy to this prophecy and what was going on. Um, they knew, you know, they knew their Messianic prophecy well enough to, some of them, to answer King Herod's question, some of the teachers, but yeah, the, the, the star, it seems like so far as we can tell, people in Israel were oblivious to that, but these guys saw it. Now, maybe for some reason their vantage point in Babylon, it was easier for them to see, or maybe it appeared to them here to lead them here, but somehow in such a way that they, that they could recognize it. There's a lot of detail that we don't have. They also... Another thing is they didn't go, they didn't travel like that. Because if you travel like that, you die of thirst in the desert, especially in those days. Um, there, there was a, a, a travel way, they call this the King's Highway. It's existed since before Bible times even began, where it goes like over the top like this, and so you always enter Israel from the north, even if, you, um, even if you're coming from the east. Oh, me, oh my. Seems like there was a. Oh, oh well, here's an interesting, an interesting thing to consider. One of the things that both Matthew and Luke are emphasizing is that, um, and it, and they do this in different ways. But Christ is a Jewish Messiah. He's an Israelite Messiah, but he also came to redeem Gentiles. And in fact, in Matthew's gospel, the greater emphasis is on Christ's work for his people Israel, though the Gentiles are, are part of that as well. And Luke has the stronger emphasis on the Gentiles. But Luke also has an incredible e emphasis on Jesus' concern for the poor. Why do I bring this up? Because Matthew and Luke both talk about two different sets of guests at the birth of Christ, those who were can't come to witness the birth of the newborn king. Uh, pretty soon here we'll decorate for Christmas. We'll get our lovely manger scene out. Um, and when we get our manger scene out, one of the things you'll notice is we have Mary and Joseph and the baby, and we have uh, all these animals because they're in a stable, right? And who else do we have? The shepherd. The shepherd. Well, we have shepherds, and we have the kings, the magi, the wise men. They probably weren't actually kings, but you know, there is that song, We Three Kings, so we might have to uh, rethink that a little. But, okay, so here's, here's the thing. Magi were elite members of society, but not Jewish society, probably over here in Babylon, which would have been at the time part of what is called the Parthian Empire, if you uh, want to get real historical. Okay, um, so... One of the sets of witnesses, there's more than, there, there, probably, there may have even been more than three, it just says there were magi, we don't know, it could have been two, it could have been five, but usually, traditionally, it's thought of as three. They're not Jews, but God calls them to witness the birth of the Israelite king. So, who are the guys from Israel that God kind of notifies, hey, 
He's here. It's not the Pharisees, Sadducees, it's not the religious leaders. It ain't King Herod. It's the shepherds. And some of you may remember from last year, or maybe two years ago, I don't know. It's all, it all runs together. But one of the things we talk about periodically is how shepherds were kind of the, the, the poor and outcast in Jewish society of the, of the time. They were, uh, they were not well thought of individuals because they, were, they, they lived out, out on the land under the stars, and people thought of them as kind of shifty and dangerous. And these are the kind of the people who were not trusted by most people because they're like some of the poor and the kind of the people in society that we get kicked around. These are the people Jesus is, or the, that God welcomes to be witnesses of the newborn king. Elites from, from Babylon, but to show that God is concerned with redeeming Gentiles, not just Jews, but what people from Israel? The poorest we got just to show that God... God cares about them, that, that, that Jesus wasn't just sent for the elite. Jesus is for everybody. And throughout the Gospel of Luke, that's something that's a theme you see. Luke and the book of Acts, in fact, this, this strong concern God has for the poor, the outcast. All right, any other questions here? Yeah, well, that's probably uh, probably good for our study tonight. Give us plenty of time for our prayer time. So, uh, if you had any uh, visitors online tonight, welcome. And uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comment section here.